It's the same. Is hope, yes. Open one? Oh, whatever Max said. I, I, that's why I jumped on and it remembered the password. Okay. Whatever it was. Yes. Okay. Because I don't remember it. So. Oh. So as usual, <laughs> pretty fried. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hopefully I'll be coherent again. Was anybody there last night? Uh, yeah, a couple of you guys. Yeah. It was quite the phenomenal experience. And um, I'm going to actually start with a story from it because uh, I think I started this course by saying that um, there's always something new to learn, always. And so last night, um, we, had the, we had the concert at Fowler Park, and the, the, the inaugural concert at Fowler Park. And I was very nervous because I had never worked with this sound guy before. And he's kind of the equivalent of like if, if Paul McCartney was jamming with me. That, that as a sound man, okay? He has mixed the Rolling Stones, Bon Jovi, uh, Beyonce, Eric Clapton, he was telling me stories, okay? So I'm a little nervous about working with this guy. <laughs> He's really, a, really a great guy, really great attitude. But what I wanted to do was, I wanted to sit back and see how he did. Because he's, he's used to mixing arena shows, right? And uh, I've never mixed an arena show. I've mixed some festivals. Um, but um, it basically, if you're unknown, you will not speak to me. Um, uh, and, and basically, what he brought to the vent, to the park last night was a scaled-down arena sound system. I mean, boy, it did sound good! It was <laughs> so good. It was to die for. And uh, two things I want to bring up. One, um, he did. Remember, I told you about gain structure and how to get the most gain you can. Uh, as close to the source as you can. He did it completely differently. And I had heard about this method, but I'd never seen anybody do it. But there are these, there are sound guys who like to have the faders sitting at zero all the time during mixing and just up and down a little bit from zero. And the reason for that is because you'll find this out when you're playing with the, with the faders, they're logarithmic. So they have a lot of um, movement for fine adjustments right around zero. But you get lower and then a little, a little tiny little adjustment will make a big difference. So there's real advantage to doing that. So what he did to set the gain on any given channel was he put the fader at zero and then he went to the, to the pre-amplifier gain and just turned it up till we liked the level. And whatever it was is whatever it was. And it worked great. But which really, it was really amazing to see. And then I, then, but it was really a different mixing experience for me. You know, then he handed it over to me and it was really a different mixing experience for me because I had to move the faders so much <laughs> to get a change. And I was used to being really careful. So, a different way to do it. Um, there is no one right way. And that's, that's another lesson to be learned here. And the other thing that he did extremely effectively is he used gates all over the place. All over the place. He was like, oh, what's gate that? And I was like, are you sure you want to? <laughs> and, and the problem is mostly with the drums, especially in an outdoor situation like that. The drummer, the last time I worked with this drummer, he uh, um, had, was using his own kit and he had it tuned to perfection. And, and, my, the, and I literally took maybe five minutes on the drums and he was astonished. But he says, it, they just sounded so good, I didn't have to do anything. Uh, last night, he, he flew in from Florida to, just for this gig and he flew back today. And so he had to borrow a, a drum kit. And you've probably had to deal with that. Yep. It's not a pleasant experience usually. They're usually pretty hacked and not tuned, and he had maybe 15 minutes with it to get it in shape. And so when he hit the time, it would go, <coughs> you know, have this really long ring. All of the drums did. And so uh, Mike, the sound, the sound man, uh, just 
pulled up the gate window and just tweaked and tweaked and tweaked and he got it to sound just perfect by using the right attack time, the right hold time, the right release time, and the right sensitivity so that he didn't miss any of the ghost notes or anything like that. Ghost notes are the light drumming things they do, right? So, throw out everything I taught you and start over. Okay? Start back to week one. That's right. No, it's a, it's a valuable lesson. Seriously, your, your head, you always have to be willing to learn, and it's really fun to learn from. He was a master, an absolute master, and he's my guy. He just lives in Lake Mills, okay? And he's my guy from here on out. He's like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll do all of them for you, so it's going to be fantastic. Anyway, a little bit of review. Um, use a DI on acoustic guitars. That's what we do. Um, generally, it's the safest thing if you... Uh, you get into things like bluegrass and stuff, they like to like huddle around a single mic, which is a nightmare if you're trying to get a lot of level. Um, watch out for that plasticky sound <laughs> and use a sound hill cover if you need to. Um, electric guitars, get a good tone. Work together with the electric guitar player and play with the, play with EQ and play with compression um, and just get a good tone. Uh, bass guitars, try a sharp peak at 600 hertz to get clarity. I was going to bounce this off of this guy last night, but I didn't have time. Um, because initially there was no definition on, on the bass, and I complained to him about it. We worked on it a little bit. Um, but after, and this is really typical for a show, I felt like, okay, the, the whole show sounded really great, okay. But I felt like I finally got the mix together on the second to the last song. <laughs> it was like everything was, I was really focused on the vocals and his guitar work because he's just a brilliant guitarist. Um, and I was kind of right in the lane of death with his guitar amp because he's a punk player, right? So they just turn everything up to 10. And this is his blues band. And I, you know, I asked him to turn down, he, of course he did. Um, but um, it was a, a great guitar tone, but really loud, right in, and right in my face. So I had to make sure that everyone else was hearing it to get it through the play. So I was really focused on that. And then I noticed on the third from the last song that I had no definition on the kick. That, that little snap that you always want to hear, it wasn't there. There was all the, all the thump, so I was kind of getting away with it. So I, I went in and EQ'd it and then Everything sounded wonderful for the last two songs. <laughs> it, it, it sounded great. The, rest the, of the it. bass was muddy. We heard I was there for like the first three or four songs. Yeah, it, it was pretty muddy. It was muddy. I mean, you could tell what he was playing. He, could, yeah. he was going up and down his progressions, but yeah. like you said, it wasn't real. It wasn't real crisp. Real I wasn't crisp. happy with it at first, but we got it dialed in. And it, it, I missed that part. The dialed in part? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you went to watch the game. <laughs> I got to go watch the first part of music and the other part of the family. Priorities. Go watch the game, so Priorities. Okay. And keys rule. Okay. That's what you have to know about keys. Um, so yes. Um, <clears throat> that's this is what tonight is about, and tonight is going to be mostly lab. Okay. So I'm going to try and zoom through this. Uh, um, We'll just talk a little bit about some philosophy and stuff, and then we'll get... I'm going to mix a song in front of you. But I was just playing it, playing it on these speakers in this room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll see what it sounds like, all right? But you'll learn a few things. So we did this last night, um, which I, I was happy to see him do this, but um, he had, he's, he had uh, two separate... Um, really high-end DSP units. So um, he, he used something, I think I, I explained this to you, uh, uh, a line array. We had line arrays last night and, and uh, what, some of the best speakers that are built in the whole world we were using last night. We had them uh, as a line array and the thing with the line arrays is you have to have computers driving them. And because with line arrays there are actually a whole bunch of speakers in arcs, right? And, and you have to tune them so they act as one speaker. And 
it was phenomenal. He, t he tuned it all up by running white noise through it. Now there's, we'll talk about the different kinds of noise that's written up, written up there, but he ran noise through it and he got, he got it so that it was a flat frequency response across the whole spectrum, okay? And as a result of that, you could walk that whole bowl and never, it never changed the tone. It would just get quieter or louder. It was the same for everybody. And I have never worked with a PA that was like that. It was delightful. But um, white noise has a flat response across the whole frequency spectrum. Some people use pink noise because pink noise is sim more similar to the way you actually hear things. It actually loses a dB per octave. And what is an octave? An octave is 10 times. So 1K, 10K, 100K. Those are octaves, right? And brown noise is this weird thing that's minus. And there's red noise, and there's blue noise. <laughs> and you can forget about them, but they exist. <clears throat> and uh, this is similar to what he did last night. Um, he had two PCs going, because he had two of these brains going, and um, ran the noise through the system, and had, a, had a, a measurement microphone, and watched the response, and just tuned it all. Um, we. Uh, the system here's already gone through that and it's permanently installed. But you will see this happen and you may encounter a need to do it someday. Okay. So, tonight we're going to put a song together. This is the step that, uh, this is the order that I do it in. But uh, basically, it's really, really important to get the foundation right. Um, if, you, if you don't get it right, you're going to be struggling the, the whole time you're mixing the band. And in, in rock music, which is basically what we do, it's the bass and the drums. Just take as much time as you can on those, as you, as you need, but <coughs> um, you know, we spend most of the, spent most of the time in the sound check on the drums. <coughs> and then uh, a little bit on uh, the bass. We should have spent more on the bass. <coughs> and then the rest of it we kind of just blasted through because he d uh, I was encouraged to see that he does a lot of what I do. But these two other things that I told you about were really different. Um, but there's EQ points, like with the kick. He took that ugly 250 hertz and dipped it down like I always do. Oh, but he had another one that he dipped down. He likes to dip down 1K, which I'd never seen anybody do. It sounded great. But it might have had something to do with uh, how his system reacts to certain things, because he knows his system. <coughs> um, and then this is just a suggestion on um, the order in which to do things. You can mix it up if you want. Sometimes if the if, I'm, if I surprise the guitar player and he's like, oh, i got to change my strings, man, or whatever, then I'll you know, move on the keys and vocals and everything and go back for efficiency's sake. But this is a pretty good way to do it because the foundation is the, is the bass and the drums, and then all the instrumentation, you want to get a nice tonal balance between all of it so that when they work together it sounds good. And then you want the vocals to sit on the, on the top, and then if I've got time to pay attention to the tracks, I do. Um, I try with the tracks here, the tip with the tracks here, get a good listen to them by soloing the channel, right, with pushing the buttons so that you hear only the tracks in your headphones. And make sure you understand what role they're playing in the song. Um, because honestly, there's been times when I forget about the tracks because the band's doing a great job. But then I might hear I might solo it and go, oh, there's a great string part. That would make it even better, you know, stuff like that. <coughs> um, this is my philosophy of doing things. Other people have other philosophies. But I try and create, especially here, I try and create an even blend with the vocals slightly out front. Now, I mix the vocals a little bit tighter to the music than most um, church guys, <laughs> right? Uh, because of my rock background, and it tends to add a lot more 
feeling of power to the music. Uh, a, a, a lot of uh, churches are afraid, kind of afraid of doing that. It's supposed to be a kumbaya sing-along thing, you know, right? And and they're, so they're afraid of that the vocals will get buried. But if you if you uh, get your your tones right, the vocals will sit really well in the vo in in the mix. Uh, what was that last tune you gave me to mix? It had like a thousand guitar parts. Um, do it again. Do it again. That was a really good example of that. Okay, um, it it literally had six guitar tracks, I think, something like that. Um, keys, bass, drums, um, and two vocals. And um, I saw, I saw. He sent me the tracks. I saw all of them, and I went, "Oh boy." Um, and but but I. Because I had the luxury of working on it in my studio and didn't have to do it live or anything, um, I was able to spend a little time with it, and um, the mix just sort of fell out. Because um, I guess the way I mixed it and, and the track, particular parts he was playing and stuff like that, I was able to mix it so that the guitars just sounded absolutely huge. But the vocals, you could still hear the vocals and understand them. They were like just barely above the guitars, which was fine for this big crescendo part. By then you know the words and everybody's singing along. And here, of course, we've got the advantage the lyrics are up on the screen. Of course, that increases intelligibility a lot. Um, so anyway, I like to mix it tighter. Your mileage may vary. Um, typically, when when the tune is cruising along, no one instrument should dominate. Now, it depends on who you're mixing, what the genre is, and all of that. Here, that's going to be generally true. I think if, if we, as we move forward, if the Lord provides other musicians that are really good instrumentalists, um, that may change up a little bit. Um, I really like to do this fourth thing. When there's no vocals, I like to like juice the keys or juice something. Give the 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 uh, congregation something to focus on. Okay, so I mean it's like if you're if you're watching a TV show and, and nothing in particular is happening, you're going to lose interest, right? So look for something interesting, and this, this is especially important during uh, rehearsal find those interesting things that you can pull up and then and then remember to pull them back down I mean, uh, last night a lot of the mixing that i did was pulling stuff down when he sang and then juicing i mean last night it was his guitar and the keyboards it was dead easy but um and yeah i don't use scenes just because i like to live on the edge but um <laughs> But you guys may find them useful. And last night, Mike, every, you know, like when we would get stuff dialed in and said, I'm saving this. And he would, every time that we got, it was like, you know, um, think of it like saving your video game, right? What, what are you willing to lose? Um, so, you know, he did that. I, uh, it depends. I haven't explored um, that functionality on the Avantis. I'll, I'll look into it so that um, I can transfer the knowledge to you guys. Um, it, hopefully it's easier than, than most, but I find, I find the whole process kind of clunky, just because of the way I grew up, I guess. <coughs> All right, lab. <coughs> so, those are the raw files, and um, I'm, al I'm also giving you a, a, a reference mix. So what you guys are going to do is you're going to go home and download those raw files, and uh, how many tracks are there? Looks like about 15, 16 tracks maybe. And you're gonna get, try and get those raw files to sound like the reference mix. That's what you're gonna do. And I'm not gonna grade it. I'm not even gonna listen to it unless you really want me to. It's an exercise. It's for you to try and figure out how I got where I got. And I'm going to go through it tonight. I'm going to play the reference mix. We'll listen to the whole thing. And then I will go back to the raw tracks 
and try as best I can on these speakers in this room to build up a decent mix and we'll see what it sounds like. And, you, and you'll be able to watch everything I do and I'll try and narrate it as I go and you stop me and say, why did you just do if you don't understand, okay? <coughs> um, yeah, that's it. That's it for the presentation. So, <clears throat> this guy, this guy down. Okay, so um, this is the uh, reference mix, and I'll actually pull up the, uh, what is that? That's the TV. Okay. Go away. There we go. No. Nope. All right. Anyway, I'm going to pull up the mixer here, and what have we got? here on channels. Um, so I think, we, what have we got? We've got uh, kick, snare, hat, tom one, tom two, tom three. Three toms? Who, who gave me three toms? It was probably you. Crash, ride. Yeah, so, okay, so this is electronic drums. Yeah, because the reason I can tell is because um, normally it's not crash and ride, it's, it's overhead left and overhead right, but when it's electronic drums, they give you the symbols like that, sometimes. Anyway, um, and then I've got uh, a plate reverb to be used for the drums. You can see up here, these are my auxiliary sends, and I'm sending um, the snare and all of the toms to the plate reverb. And then over here, we've got a drum submix. So what I did is I took all the drums and I attached them to this fader so that once I get a nice blend here, I can just turn them all up and down. We're gonna be doing the same thing in that room with the Avantis, with these th the DCAs, if you remember those guys, right? And then let's see, we got a tumba and a bongo and a djembe. So uh, Micah went nuts on this one. And it's gonna be a really good, um, exercise for you because you've got all these instruments to play with, right? And then uh, I put all the percussion on its own fader, in this case. You've got bass, acoustic guitar, a uh, couple of rhythm guitar tracks, uh, a lead, and a solo track. So probably a couple of different parts. And then, um, okay, what's going on? got to be uh, slide these uh, faders over so we can see the other ones but I don't see um, uh, I don't see this the bar at the bottom yeah this guy you mean yeah is that it no that's not it there we go there we all right so now we're just sliding this the mixer's too big to fit on the screen <coughs> um, and then I put all the electric guitars together. So I, I, I went crazy with that because there was just so much to deal with. Um, you can do this if you want on the Avantis. You've got this much flexibility, okay? It's not typical that you would do it on Sunday. We're not going to have three guitar players up there and two percussionists and a drummer. We're not going to, well, not Maybe on the first. Maybe Easter? Yeah. <laughs> we got close to that. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. I say, we'll all be on stage. <laughs> yeah. Every one of us. Oh, uh, and then we got piano, synth, accordion. And notice I did not put the keys on their sub mixer because they're superior and they don't need it. <laughs> anyway, uh, background vocal, lead vocal, and a general reverb. So this is a pretty typical setup for the way I do things in the studio. And uh, as far as reverbs go, it's what I do um, live, too. I'll have a plate reverb, a big reverb, 
and then I'll have a couple of delays to play with usually. Um, and those combined ones, the blue sliders, that's mainly for volume control. You can yeah, these. Are, this is just. Well, I do put processing on them right. too, but um, with the DCAs, you're not going to be able to like put all the drums on the one DCA and then put like a compressor on that because all the DCAs are, if you'll recall, they're like a remote control for the rest of the faders. It doesn't actually go through that channel. It's not really a channel. It's just a remote control, okay? So you can't do that. There's, uh, on old analog mixers, there were things called subgroups. That's what these are. They're subgroups. The audio actually passes through there, so I can do additional processing if I want to. <coughs> um, all right, so. Okay, somehow I got detached from the mixer. No? I'm not seeing deflection here. Okay, this is going to be troubleshooting 101. Um, <laughs> Let's see here. I don't usually this, use this app, but I'm not seeing any. Uh, so on the app, I'm not seeing any any meters. But I don't know that's not doing anything. Yeah, see, I'm, so somehow I'm not attached. Um, so have you tried turning it off and on again? That's what I'm going to do. Um, uh, I, no, I'm on a different network. There's a network, if you guys want to have a peek, there's a network called X18-48-70-93. That's this guy. <coughs> and, now uh, let's see. Let's go. They're both on that. It's coming through the TV. Okay, the TV's, the, the HDMI, when I plugged it into the computer, the computer said, oh, he wants to hear sound through the TV. Yeah, so, yeah, let's see, we go headphones. Okay, now this might be pretty loud. We can pull it back. Hey. So, this is another thing that I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has, I, I edited it, I, I thought that the, the uh, hand percussion stuff and the guitar stuff was so cool that I created an intro and threw it on, on the front of this. So if you want to take that challenge on, go ahead. It doesn't have much to do with live mixing, but it's fun. So, so this whole instrumental intro on the raw tracks that you get, it's not going to be there.
We're going to listen to a little bit one more time. Um, this was set up for subwoofers. Um, the last time I used these was for a concert on my porch here. Now, we are going to have a listen to uh, we're going to listen to the way it sounds when I typically get it. Okay, so this is going to be a different experience. <laughs> um, kind of doesn't matter. I mean, it's nice to watch the bouncy meters and stuff. But, um, okay. Sounds really great, doesn't it? Want to travel shooting? Um, you did a lot of work to go from this to that. Yeah. <laughs> Again. Yeah. There we go.
off tracks. So, what do you expect? Um, so, uh, I already have all the sub groups set up and everything in this. Which buzz really bothers me. We're just gonna have to live with it, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so, typically, what I do is I just start at the beginning and start working on the kick. Now, the kick doesn't come in for a minute here. Let me uh, get it queued up for that. This is what I did for the EQ on this particular one. I did some pretty radical things. Let's kick it in. Quite the difference. Um, what did I do? I um, there it is. <coughs> I boosted at 52 hertz. I gave it like a seven decibel boost. And then over here, I gave it a, a boost at um, about 3K in order to get the slap of the, of the kick, right? Now this solo by itself, you might not think, well, this is not a, a great kick kick song. You start layering all the other stuff on top of it, all of a sudden it makes sense. So like, uh, like last night, um, I tweaked on, on those last two songs. I really boost the high end on the kick drum. And I didn't want the master to see me doing it because I didn't know what he'd think of it. But that's what I wanted. <laughs> but he was really cool, so he, he probably wouldn't have had any trouble. But anyway, so that's kick drum. Another thing that I did is I put a compressor on it. You hear that? Yeah, it, it fattened it up quite a bit. Because it gave it some gain. So we have to look. Look, okay. So what's going on with this compressor here? You can see we're hitting it all the time. I've got a pretty low threshold so that we're hitting the compressor all the time. I've got a, almost a seven to one compression. So for every one unit of increase in volume, we're slamming it. Excuse me. For every seven units of gain. We're only allowing it to change one unit. Right? That's how compressors work. And then I've got a, a pretty soft knee, and I've got a, an attack of 11 milliseconds so that that snap comes through and the release is uh, 230 milliseconds. It's got a little bit of a ring there. I, pro I, I didn't notice that before, but. Um, I might strive to clean that up maybe with a gate. Um. There. So this is what I did with the snare apparently. Let's turn it on. I added a little bit of meat to it, right? If you think Last night the guy, the guy's snare was really a bright snare, and when you looked at the, at the real-time analyzer, there wasn't even anything there at all. So we couldn't make it fat. I wanted it fatter, and there was no way to do it. That's the way he liked to have his drums. Um, maybe he's a jazz player most of the time or something. I don't know. Um, let's uh, start that over again. Snare comes in. There we go. And then I think I also uh, threw some compression on it. Uh, oh no. I did a cheat. So you're not going to have this option available to you. But what I did is uh, the thing called tape saturation. So. This simulates recording the drums to a tape. And what they used to do back in the day is they would overdrive the tape on purpose because it changed the tonal characteristics 
of this of whatever you sent to it. Um, and and these days they'll they'll record a whole record on computer, and then dump it to tape, and then put it back into the computer just so they can get that. Yeah. This is a, a tape saturation simulator, and just for your edification, we'll see if you can hear what what it does. This is without it. This is it's a little subtle, but you can hear that water, right? And in this case, it's got a little bit of a volume boost as well. So now, uh, typically, what I would do then is listen to these guys together. sort of, the, the way the kick is EQ'd is already sitting a little bit better in what we're building, right? I mean, when you, like I said, when I solo would kick along, it sounds mm. a little artificial. Um, and then, uh, what, what is this? That's the hat. I don't think, oh yeah, you're doing some hat work on this. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> okay. And, this is typically what you would do with a hat, right? Roll off all the low end, there's nothing there anyway. And maybe brighten it up a bit, depending on what you like. Um, let's turn it on. And I brighten it up. So cut through the mix a little bit. can be hard to find. <laughs> uh, let's close these guys. See if we can find where the Toms live. There we go. There's one. Um, guess I can look here, can't I? Um, so let's... I'm going to make a loop here. And the toms on um, drum machines, excuse me, on electronic drums, they're kind of, uh, they usually sound pretty good out of the chute. Um, kicks and snares I have issue with. These sound pretty good, but they sound actually so good that you, if you've got a good ear, you go, eh, you're cheating there, it's electronic drums. Um, <clears throat> so I honestly doesn't look like I did much with the uh, toms. So gave it a little bit of juice. Uh, what is that? Around 120, 130 hertz, and uh, and I gave it boost on the high end so I could hear the sticks on the head. So um, you listen. That's without. This is with. Without. With. A little bit of a difference. It's a little subtle. Um, so if we listen to everything together again. We're starting to get somewhere here. Um, and then we this Tom here, let's, let's do this, and Tom 2. I'm not sure you did much work on this one. Oh, there it is. Is it? Okay. <laughs> so it sounds a little dull to me, but I didn't do anything to it. Huh. Okay. Well, I might, in hindsight, do something like, let's see what's it doing here. Just brighten it up a little bit. Give it a little definition. So that's with, and here's without. I 
big difference. It might be too much, I don't know, but we'll leave it for now. And then this one, see if, did you just do a, yeah, you just went round yep. the toms. <laughs> okay, so that, first of all, I got it panned hard left. Um, so it's probably, it's not something you're gonna do here, okay? This is for a, a stereo mix. Um, <coughs> I tend to mix from the audience's point of view, not the drummer's point of view. So you think about, you think about, you're looking at the drum kit, his floor tom is over on that side. So that's how I mix it. Other people do it the other way around. <coughs> anyway, this guy, let's put him straight up the middle for now. Once again, feels a little dull, maybe a little wooly, and sure enough, I um, EQ'd out, once again, around 250 hertz, 244 hertz, and this guy, where is this guy, is at 3K, so um, this is without, this is with. Pretty big difference. There's a lot of clarity in this now. If you listen to it, as compared to the without. So that was losing that low mid. That, that tends to muddy stuff up, and and adding a little snap to it. <coughs> so if we, uh, and then what do we got? Crash. We can have a look at this. Um, a lot like the uh, hi hat. It's kind of just a symbol approach. There's nothing you want over here, so just lose it, and you might want to brighten it up a little bit. And uh, I'm sure that the other guy's like this too. Or my, oh no, I just left him flat. Um, so now if we listen to the whole kit, oh, listen to the whole kit. Um, snare and the toms, but not the kick, not the cymbals, not the hat. just enough so that you miss it if it's not there. So what typically what I'll do is I'll, I'll turn it up uh, when it's like solo till I like it and I'll do it on all three of the like on the toms and the snare <coughs> and then I'll pull up the whole kit and usually you can't hear the reverb then but then you mute it and you go what happened? Right? So it's, it's this it becomes more of a, uh, well, it's, it becomes a lot more subtle when you actually throw it into the mix. And uh, this is something to, to, to keep in mind in the room here because reverbs actually make a difference in that room. Um, if you really want to actually hear the reverb, which we do often in this kind of music, um, when you're just soloing the, the channel, um, the amount of reverb that you use is really different than the amount of reverb that you use when the whole band is playing. If you want to hear the reverb as this thing, right? So um, sometimes uh, Nathan will wail, and when he wails, I like to juice the verb and the delay so it sounds like it's in the Grand Canyon. But then I have to remember to pull it back as soon as it comes right, because it becomes a mess otherwise. <coughs> But if you were to just solo his voice with that, it would sound ridiculous. But you throw it in on top of the band, it sounds good. So, <coughs> um, and 
then we've got the tumba. Now this, um, I have to find where he plays it. We play it, probably played it right at the beginning. Oh no, not till over here. Honestly, with this big of a mix, you're not going to hear anything but that snap going on in here. So you basically, unless you're featuring the instrument, you basically kind of just want to get it out of the way, except for that additional snap that it adds to the groove. <coughs> um, and then we've got bongos. Enter here apparently. I'm going to ask you guys what should I do? Anybody got some ideas? I don't like the way it sounds. in terms of the whole mix now, not in terms of what does this drum sound like. So that's kind of a little bit of a paradigm shift that you have to put in your head. In this semi-artificial environment, it's more of a problem. In, in real life, you're going to be dealing with everybody up there while you're doing a sound check anyway. <coughs> what I would do with this is, once again, I would look for, and it looks like I didn't do anything to this, so I'm about to eat my words, but I would look for, I would look for, um, once again, adding a little snap to them, so that, they're, so that when I throw them in this big mix, you're going to be able to tell that they're there doing something. Um, too extreme it's really pretty tough to tell on these on these speakers um, and then we've got uh, a djembe djembe's are now this in this case we've only got one mic on the djembe do you remember how you mic it probably don't remember. I think it was all TV50 yeah it's, a, it's on the TV50 okay so it's all electronic, all electronic drums oh, oh. programs oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, all right. <coughs> That's disappointing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really convincing. Thank you. I'm impressed. <laughs> um, okay. And I didn't. I didn't do anything.
solo the hand percussion stuff. See, I haven't messed with the gains at all. Um, but probably what was going on, because it was an electronic kit, he had his phones on or something, and he adjusted the gains so that it sounded nice. Yeah. Because it sounds pretty nice, just out of the chute. <coughs> um, over to bass. And I did, looks like I did my just, I don't know, I did something a little more extreme. Um, I did a, well, it's about a six, 540 hertz boost, um, just to give it some definition. And I actually rolled off the low end because there's so much going on down there. Um, at least that's probably why I did it. So if we, uh, now we have to find where it's actually playing something here. Um, looks like over here, some bass action. does for you in, in this world is it, especially with all the droney stuff we do all the time, mm -hmm. is it gives the congregation a clue that there was a chord change. Because everyone else on the keys and the guitar, they're just playing the same note. <laughs> while, the you know, while there's some vocals going over the top, and the only thing that's changing pitch is the bass. So it's a, it's a really important role in those kinds of songs. <clears throat> this kind of song, obviously, it's much more rhythmic. And so there's a different approach to the bass. But, uh, and it's, and it's, um, it's not real bassy because of all the other stuff that's going on. It sounds like it's bassier than it really is, right? If you solo it again, it's not what you just think you heard. That's a pretty good start. Um, and then we 
we've got the acoustic guitar. I don't remember where this, what's that? Oh, I got verb going on on that. Um, okay, so this I probably did not feature very much. Well, maybe I did. to me sounds Sorry we don't have it on the mixer, but um and I'm compressing it, but I'm using a a compressor model. If you'll notice <clears throat> on this one, and you might run into this, I don't think the Avantis has this comp particular compressor model, but in olden times there was a kind of compressor that didn't give you a threshold or a knee just gave you a ratio and the and the threshold and the knee kind of moved around with the ratio on its own uh, they were old tube compressors and then they started to add controls and stuff but they had their own characteristic their own flavor and um, they were typically it depends but they were typically a little more musical and a little sort of warmer I think that word is overused but um, I just felt it worked better for the guitar um, and then we got rhythm guitar. Here. It's fine. I might want to brighten it up in the past, but I think I'm going to leave it. Uh, we got uh, probably another guitar. I'm not going to do anything with that either. But, but if you listen to it, uh, and John and Nathan, you'll understand what, what I'm talking about here. I can hear a compressor on that. Because it's this, it, you can hear the attack, and I go, like this. It feels like it's being just a little strangled when, when, he, when he sustains the chord. Listen to it. done for a tonal effect. Now you wouldn't want that on a lead singer. It sounds really awful when, when you do that. Uh, but once again, it depends on the singer, I guess. But, um, <laughs> uh, and then we've got... So typically when I get pre-recorded you know, stuff to, to mix, Especially guitar players have spent a lot of time getting their tones, and it, the only problem might occur if, if they, if their tonal choice or their, the choice of part, um, doesn't blend well with everything else that's going on. But in this case, everything's fine. Um, and uh, this, well, now this other, this next guitar, I did something to. I did quite a bit to um, see if we can find where it kicks in here. Uh, oh, it's just this. This might have been something that. What is this? Oh, okay. It's the lead. Okay. And we got all of this bright percussion stuff going on, slamming around and stuff. And this lead has got this kind of warm, nice tone. Which is not helping it in this scenario. So I, 
looks like what I did was um, I took out some low mids to brighten it up a little bit. So this is a kind of a uh, oh, a use of EQ, which um, a lot of engineers suggest is the only way you should do things, which is to subtract things, not add, but to subtract. I just do whatever is needed. <laughs> but, but purists will do this, and you know, it, you know, if I get 98% there, that might get you 100% there. But that's that's kind of the difference with within a computer. Now, this habit stems from the days of old analog devices where um, the first equalizers that came out, you could only subtract, you couldn't add. But then they figured out how to do that, but they didn't sound great, as good as if you just carefully subtracted. So, you know, there's a lot of back and forth about whether that's a good thing or not. Um, <coughs> let, let's uh, have a listen to what happens if we kick it in, so. It's without. So that, that really helped it to jump forward, obviously. But here's another thing, and this is uh, the downside of compressors. It also jumped the noise forward, because he's playing through his tube amp, which got all this hiss going on. And when he played it originally, you know, it wasn't such a big deal, but now I've compressed it really hard, so you're going to hear all of it. So listen to this. So I edited it. I mean, you're not, that's, uh, that's an awful edit. Okay. But you don't hear it with all the other stuff that's going on. So I got away with it. Because there was just too much noise, but I wanted to hear the, the note right to the end. I didn't want to fade it out before it was done. Um, so that was a really typical uh, response that you're going to hear when you when you compress something really really hard. The, remember, what's going on is you're turning down the loud parts, which means the quieter parts in re relation to it, relationship to those loud parts, is going to get louder. So that's the push, the give and take of of using a compressor in this scenario. And what is this? What did I do here? Oh. <laughs> oh, I added a plate reverb to it. It just it just makes it have this real character. You know? I just felt like it was just lying there like a dead fish, you know. So. <laughs> um, I guess that and then you go over here, what do we got? We got the piano, which is just flat, because keys don't need help. Well, here's <laughs> the synthesizer I did something extreme to here. I um, wonder what it's doing. Let's find, find the synth where it's playing here. Oh, okay, looks like here. during the bridge, it sounds like. And um, it must have been really, really bright because it looks like I dulled it down quite a bit. But let's hear. Um, I think it was kind of, this is a case where, is the bridge, did the bridge have that guitar solo in it? No. No? Okay, this is just the praise God, praise God. Yeah. Okay. Um, The, I believe the choice that I made here is there's the synthesizer part, but there's also an accordion thing going on, right? I thought the accordion was more interesting. So I featured that and I downplayed the synth, I think is what it did. So, that's 
the way it sounds without doing anything to it. Here's what I did to it. So it just sits in the background. Because that, that, all of that buzzy high stuff, which sounds nice when you play it by itself, it's going to walk all over the accordion. You'll never hear the accordion. <coughs> um, and then, yeah, here's the accordion. So. I did nothing with that. So let's do a little experiment here. And we'll play these two together. And I'll have no EQ on the synth the first time I play it. And I'll throw the EQ on the second time. The, synth, the accordion's getting lost. Now listen to it. good example of, of the use of subtractive equalization in order to get one instrument out of the way of the other one. Decide which one is the important one and feature that one. <coughs> um, and then uh, we had vocals and these typically, let's see, when I get vocals from uh, Nathan, they're in pretty good shape because he's got pretty good vocal chain. He's got a good, nice mic and a good, a good interface and stuff. But when, when I get it from, especially during COVID, when I was getting it from people's iPhones and stuff, <laughs> it was really interesting to try and fix that up. Um, and there's a, there's a whole, that's a whole other, a whole other class. But, um, and, and we, it's not something we're going to encounter in there and we don't have the tools on that box anyway. <clears throat> so let's have a listen to and praise God from whom all blessings flow praise him oh, praise him it's a nice reverb for the wonders of his love it's really nice oh. <laughs> anyway this yeah, yeah, yeah we did yeah. Uh, recording up here. <laughs> yeah okay that's what I thought. So to me, the vocal sounded a little dull. Um, especially in, we, remember, we're coming out, this is the bridge, but we're coming out of the, all the heavy percussion stuff with all the cymbals and, and the dinky things and the slappy things. And if we come out with a vocal like this, it's going to be just completely anticlimactic. So I, I did the... Uh, I pass filter thing because we don't need rumble and stuff, and then I just brighten it up a little bit. So let's hear the difference. And then I, I did some other processing. We'll throw that on there too in a minute. But here's without. And praise God from whom all blessings flow. And here's with. And praise God from whom all blessings flow. So it's a little subtle, but you can hear his breath. You hear the S's a little better, right? <coughs> and then what did I do? I probably threw a compressor on it. Oh, no, this plug-in is missing. Uh, yeah, I threw a compressor on it. So let's, uh, let's, uh, I can bypass it right here. So this is without. And praise God. Here's with. And praise God. From whom all blessings flow. So I used it to obviously boost the volume and also be the little assistant engineer who's turning the knob up and down. So, you know, to make the vocals much more even. But I also did the tape saturation. And there's an adjustment on there called bias, which brightens it up in a really different way than an equalizer does. It does it dynamically. So that's why it, it sounds brighter. As well. well, besides the fact that you're hearing it louder. Remember, when you hear things louder, you, they're going to seem brighter to you. You're going to hear the bass better. I didn't tell you about the RIAA curve. but it, You've maybe seen pictures of it, but it's an, it's an ex... So here's the graph of frequencies, right? And here is loud. And it's quieter and quieter. And this is what your ear does. It droops at both sides start losing the highs, you start losing the lows, and you're getting only the middle. 
it's just you know, anthropologists have evolutionary theories around this, but that's where the important information is for you to survive in the wild. The highs and the lows, like whatever. You know, but to hear those, the pads of the feet through the you know, the predator through the grass or whatever, you know. <coughs> um, so um, I don't know if you guys, any of you guys. Uh, I think they still throw these on some cheap stereos, but there used to be a loudness switch. Remember those? Yeah. And what they would do is they boost the low and the highs, but then what people would do is they turn it way up and do that again. <laughs> so, kind of funny. <coughs> um, and then I just put verb on everything, apparently. And praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him! Praise Him! So this, this verb, uh, it sounds like I did some kind of room. Yeah. So it sounds like it's in a, in a big room. Uh, the, what I like to do typically in uh, the church service is I'll have a verb that is basically like a cathedral. So I can get that majestic thing going if I want, but I keep it keep it way down, I usually feed kind of, uh, a lot of stuff to it, keep it way down, but the vocals I'll um, maybe feed a lot to it and then I'll really juice it during those dramatic parts. Um, <clears throat> we'll get into that when we're de doing real life stuff. So here's the whole thing without doing any level adjustment at all, but See, turn turn on all of the compressors and and everything. And the EQ is all on. Yes, no. Here's one that's not on. I'll just make sure here, and we'll see what it sounds like now. And this is once again, this is without um, doing any level uh, adjustments at all. First, I want to just throw that. Just got to make sure I didn't miss anything. Looks good. Looks good. All right, so I'm not sure what's going to happen when I hit play right here because the levels. Are, I haven't touched the levels at all. Remember? Then this is a typical. Uh, when you're doing this kind of thing, but even when you're doing a sound check, this is a typical order. You'll go through and get the equalization and the compression all together on everything, and then you worry about levels. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. Um, do that. <coughs> Oops.
you get the idea. You're just fiddling with levels until you're trying to balance things out. And uh, in this world and in the, uh, in, in the services on Sunday morning, once you get all of the tonalities together and uh, eye compression, EQ lined up and everything, um, typically what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll turn up the drums and the bass and I'll turn up the vocals and I'll, I'll try and get them happy with each other and I'll start adding all the other instruments, uh, making sure that the vocals don't get killed by everything and making sure that the other instruments don't kill the bass and drums. And I'll just go back and forth until I'm happy. Control. And that could change from song to song. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, Most likely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I told you in the beginning, uh, I don't believe in the whole set it and forget it thing, although it was a temptation last night because those guys were just, they were just really, really, really good players. But they would switch solos a lot. So one and the other. And then, and then Josh would do these, he had great guitar tone, and, and do these huge, chords that would kill his vocals if I wasn't careful. So, um, that's kind of it that I have to, oh, look at that, five minutes to spare. <laughs> Questions, concerns? Um, so the homework is to download those tracks and have some fun with them, okay? It's, uh, I'd suggest you get going on that early in the week because you're likely to, if you're like me, look up and eight hours past <laughs> when you start fiddling with this stuff. It depends you know, where your head's at and whether you've got a little baby or not. <laughs> um, but uh, do that, have some fun. Um, if you wanna text me or email me with any questions while you're at it, feel free. Maybe I'll answer. <laughs> All right? Okay, so I think next week we might go into that room figure out how I'm going to teach all of you the screens. So I may, you may get um, some communication from it during the week. I may want you to remember uh, you downloaded the software that controls this, right? I may want you to bring your laptops so that if you're not writing from the screen, you can refer to what I'm talking about. I don't know yet. Okay? iPads work too? Uh, no, the, it has to be the laptop because the iPad, I haven't been able to, to use the iPad app attached to the mixer. I still don't know its full functionality because we haven't uh, put that on the uh, wireless yet. Yeah. So it has, to be, it has to be that app and it'll just be for reference. You won't be controlling it. Right. 